Great to see you. My name is Sean Wood. I'm the lead pastor here, if we've never met before. And we are in this series that we're calling Liked. And, and we've been looking at this kind of weird tension that goes on. And, and, and for those of you who are joining us online, too, setting up for this weekend's tension, we just did One is the Loneliest Number. How many of you are old enough to remember that song? How many of you remember old enough? Yep, yep. How many of you should remember that song, but because of things you were doing when you should remember it, you don't anymore? Do you, you don't have to admit to that, but you don't tell your children about that. But anyway, so um, yeah, so we just did that here because we're setting up for the fact that, you know, all of this kind of plays into relationships, this tension of, you know, are we liked? Do we need to be liked? Do we want to be liked? Are there people who don't like us because of ways that we've hurt them? And so in week one, we kind of said, hey, you know, the most important thing is we got to know who we are in Christ and that our identity is in God. Is that right? Yeah. And then second week, we said, look, there are people that are going to hurt you, and you're going to hurt people, and you've got to kind of accept forgiveness and offer forgiveness and also offer repentance to people. And then last weekend, we said, look, you, you – got to not put everything into how you look, but your purpose in life is what matters. And we said, look, Mother Teresa didn't go around complaining about her thighs. Why? Because she had stuff to do, right? You guys know that? And so we said purpose is what matters. And then it all kind of boils down to just relationships, this tension of how do we interact with one another. And there's one relationship that all of us will come to, most of us at least, will come to at some part in our life, and that is a relationship with a significant other person, a spouse in our life, and, and it's so important to us. And so uh, I wanted to have someone come in this weekend to talk to us about what does that look like, that tension of finding the one, that, that tension of finding someone you're going to spend the rest of your life with. And it is my privilege th this weekend to have Chris, Pastor Chris Norman from Red. Redlands, California here with us, and uh, here's the deal. He and his wife Tatum are here from, from Redlands, which is Southern California. If you guys have ever been to Southern California, heard about it, perfect weather all the time, butterflies fly around your head, you don't sweat when you go outside, that kind of stuff. And so I gave them a little tutorial about South Carolina. I said, here's the earth, here's South Carolina, here's the sun. So just just so you'll know. That's one of them to kind of know what was going on. But they are here with their family, Elias and uh, Raya and uh, Cadence, and, and they are just uh, going to spend some time in South Carolina and Alabama and Florida, Georgia soon. It's going to be awesome. So I, I wanted him to come, and let me tell you how I met Pastor Chris. Is I told you guys that a couple weeks ago, I got a chance to go to Montana, and I caught like eight trout, which was great, and, and then, then also caught a 190-pound pastor. You guys remember that uh, when I caught myself? And uh, I met Pastor Pastor Chris there. I'd heard about him because he also is an ARC plant, seen a video about a great church that they planted back in January of 2014 or just knocking it out of the park there in Redlands, him and Tatum. Uh, but then also, he's not here though because of what's happened in the church and I didn't ask him to come and speak to us because of what I'd heard about him. The reason he's here this weekend is because we immediately just became friends. Just had conversations over trout fishing and, and you know, uh, just sitting out by a fire about church and life and family. And I said, I like this guy. And and I've promised you guys since the beginning of freedom that I will let you get to meet and know some of the wise friends that I have all over the country. So would you guys do it like only Freedom Church can and give Pastor Chris Norman a huge welcome as he comes to the stage. Give it up from the Southern California perfect weather. Thanks, man. Morning, Freedom Church. How are you guys? Come on. Is this the wild service? I want to let you know something about your pastor. He is tough. So he had a hook <laughs> going through his cheek. And, like, they couldn't pull it out because it was barbed. They had to, like, didn't they, Sean, did they push that through? Pastor Sean, they pushed that, they pushed that through his cheek. He didn't, he didn't, there's no crying, no wincing. I mean, they were in a boat that's moving all over the place like this, like operating on, on, on Pastor Sean and, Give it up for Pastor Sean. I mean, that's tough. 
I thought, wow. Because you know what? First thing I would have done is just whined a little bit and said, you're not touching me out here on that. Someone get me to some professionals at the ER, right? Hello, amen, like a hospital. Like get me to a hospital right now. But he's just like, bring it. Get it out. We guys, it's an honor to be with you today. Absolutely love what is happening at Freedom Church. Wow, four years old. You guys are going to be celebrating that soon and uh, amazing things that God has done already. But how many of you believe that the best things are still yet to come? Amen? That God has more for you than you could ever think or imagine in this place as you guys continue to align your hearts underneath the vision that God has pointed out on your leadership and everyone getting into, into, into their place. It takes a team, right? It takes an army of people stepping into the thing that God's called them to do to add to what God is doing, to see the big picture of what God is doing. I'm excited for you guys as you continue not only to see this area here changed, but the, the world around you. Amen? Amen, amen. Hey, well, Pastor Sean asked me today if I'd come in and share a little bit about, about relationships and this, this whole world of singleness and, and, and dating and then on in, into marriage. And so today I'm going to give you a few questions that you can ask yourself to get some biblical perspective on the relationship uh, you're in. I'm, I'm a, I have the I have successfully navigated the dating years and um, found myself married way over, way over my head. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my wife, Tatum. Norman, if you stand up, come on, baby. Stand up, stand up. And everybody, this is my beautiful wife, Tatum. And you're wondering, I know you're thinking to yourself, how in the world did that boy end up with that girl that is way out of his league, amen, like just, she's, listen, lots of prayer and fasting, you just keep yourself, yeah, and, and God will come through, persistence, you got to stalk them a little bit, um, <laughs> no, really, Tatum and I have been married now, we're going to be married now for 18 years, next month, isn't that right, next month, we'll be married for 18 years. Now, what you need to know is that I've been in love with Tatum for 20, 18, 19, 21, 22, 23, 24 years, okay? So you do the math. What that means is I stalked her from 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, stalked her for a good six years before she finally gave in to God's will for her life. You see, I knew, <laughs> I knew what God's will was for her life. It just took her a little while to catch up with what God was doing, but she finally did. But all that to say, we successfully navigated those, those dating years and married now, have three beautiful children and are enjoying the adventure that God has us on together. It's a powerful, powerful thing. But, um, but how many of you know that that doesn't mean that I have all the answers, right? God's word does have the answers, amen? And surprisingly, so I think a lot of people don't realize this. The Bible actually has a lot to say about this whole relational aspect of our life, the single years, the dating years, and on into the marriage years. But let's just find out today where we're all kind of at. If, if you're, you're married in here, why don't you raise your hand up real quick, nice and high. Come on. Yeah, marrieds. Let me hear it for the marrieds. Yeah, there you are. All right, now here we go. Ready? Let's do this. If you're single and or dating in here, raise your hand up nice and high, Okay. Okay, keep those hands up for a second. Now, if you're just single in here, keep your hand up. Okay, everyone look around. Look around, singles. Look around. All right. Keep them up. Smile nice and big. Come on now. Don't be ashamed. Come on, girl. Then get that hand in the air. Get that. Yeah. Own it. Now, all y'all going to meet in the back after service today. And we're going to be praying over you and um, see what God does there. Look, no, don't. Not now. Not now, guys. They're already standing in the back waiting. Um, so here's what I want to do today. I want to give you some biblical principles in the form of questions that we want to ask when we're looking at navigating these waters, right? Navigating these waters of moving from singlehood on, in, on, into, on into marriage. And something I want to say up front before we, we get into this to you single specifically, and there's going to be a little for everybody in this, in this message, all right? But um, something I want to say to you singles up front that I think we do a bad job of in, in church, this is where we mess things up quite a bit, I feel like, is we somehow give the impression that if you're, if you're single, that that somehow means that you're not quite 
there yet, that you haven't quite arrived. It, almost like, almost like if, you're, if you're single, you, you kind of feel this in church, and maybe you married, so you remember, if you grew up in church, you remember kind of feeling like this, like, like the finish line was, was getting married, like the goal was getting married, or like you were junior varsity until you were dating, and now you're varsity, and then you get married and you're pro, like, and that was kind of like how you saw this whole thing. Well, I need to let you know up front that that's not biblical, that's not true. Singles in here today, listen to me, your life is not on hold until you find the one. Is there the one? I don't know. We're not going to answer all that in this today. But your life is not on hold until you get to that place. God has you where you are right now for a reason, and he wants to use your life in this season of your life in ways that you couldn't possibly think or imagine. And maybe he wants to do something in your life right now that he couldn't do if you were dating, he couldn't do if, if you were married. Matter of fact, Paul said this. I want to show you this scripture. Paul the Apostle speaking in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Watch this. Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he says, I wish that all men were even as me. How was Paul? He was single and loving it. That's what he says right there. Uh, but each one has his own, everyone say that next word, what does it say? His own what? Yeah. Gift. His own gift from God. One in this manner and one in that. That word gift there, it's the word charis. It's the same word that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 when God, is, it's when God by his spirit is lift, listing the spiritual gifts uh, that he gives to the body. The word is charis. It's a divine enablement from God. And so what Paul is saying is that God gives a divine enablement to everybody. And no matter what season you're in, you've got to look at it as a, as a gift. You're going to need to live it as though it's a gift, a divine enablement from God to be in that season. Let me break it down. Listen, uh, there's those of you who are, let's put over here, you're single today. There's those of you who are married today. There's those of you that are dating today. Whatever season you're in, you need a divine enablement from God to be in that season. Amen. So marrieds, all, all the single people, I can't wait to get married. I can't wait to get married. And all the marrieds in here going, Jesus, just please help me. <laughs> Continue to divinely gift me to do what you've called me to do, right? To be married. It takes a divine enablement. And then on the other hand, it's a, it's a divine gift uh, to be single. And God may have gifted some of you in here today to be single. And he might be calling you to be single your whole life, okay? Now, if that freaks you out, you're like, no, well, then maybe you're not gifted to be single your whole life, right? Because if you're gifted to be single your whole life, you kind of settle in. You're like, this is what God's called me to do. Let me tell you this, that if that's the case, God, is gonna use, God will use that in your life in powerful ways. You can do things in your singleness that a lot of marrieds can't do. And I'm... I believe God's calling you to really examine your heart and be like, is God calling me to be married someday? Maybe he is calling me to be single. Maybe he's calling me to travel around. Maybe he's calling me to be at the, you know, helping out at the church every day all the time and be there. Maybe, what is God calling me to do with my, with my singleness? But I'd say this, whatever, if you're in that season, don't, don't wait for your life to start. Your life is happening now. Amen? Amen. You with me today? I preach a whole lot better. You guys help me out. Your life is happening now. Amen? Amen. Let's encourage our single people today. Amen. And you got to understand that. So I think we mess that up in church quite a bit, making you feel like, you know, someday you'll be there. No, no, no. You're, you're there now. Your life is not on hold. You are not less established. You're right where God wants you. But now, what if you know God has called you to get married? And you need to figure out this whole, you need to figure this whole thing out. Well, here's what you need to know is that if you are called to get married, let's put that here. I always like, I, I use props all the time when I'm preaching. So, but you got to imagine there's marriages here. Okay. God's called you to get here. You're not there yet. You're over here. And over here is your single. So between here and there, there's some steps, right? You with me? Right? I mean, there's, you, you don't just like wake up one day and like, hey, let's get married. You know, like, who are you? I don't know. It's just, we've never met. Let's tie the knot. That doesn't happen. I don't know. Maybe it does. And God bless you. And, but let's talk about, and maybe that did happen for you. I don't know. Typically, 
You're going to meet somebody, right? You're going to get yourself, you're going to find there's a relationship happening. You're, you're involved with somebody. And then, I don't know what you're going to call it, but between that, hi, we just met, I know your name, and will you spend the rest of your life with me, there's going to be this other step. Can we just all agree on that? Like, there's just another, there's another step. Now, we typically call this dating. And I know in, 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 in our in Christendom, we've kind of had this kickback against dating. We don't like dating. We've kissed it goodbye or whatever we've got to do with dating. And I totally get, I understand that. I, I get that completely because there's this connotation of dating carries with it all of these negative things. We've brought a lot of the worldly philosophy into, into it. Matter of fact, dating, we don't need to get into all of it, but it, matter of fact, the word actually, it, it, it was used early in the 1800s on, on, it was actually when a male would go out to be the prostitute, they caught dating, and some of that's been brought over into the whole dating world, and on and on and on, and so dating in the world's view, in the world's way, is absolutely, a, it's, a, it's a mess. Anyone with me, right? But, but here's what we need to do, is we need to call this something, this next level, this thing that happens between, hi, what's your name, and will we get married? There's this thing, right? There's this next level. Can we all agree to that? And just for the sake of talking today and, and, and having, moving through this, we're going to call that dating, okay? I don't care what you call it, as long as you do it in a way that honors God, okay? Can we just all say amen right there? Like, amen, just honor God with whatever you're going to call this, courting, dating, whatever, okay? You just honor God, honor God with, with this season, with this season, of your life. And so what I want to do is today give you a few questions, four questions that can help you do this well, do this well, and do marriage well, but specifically to help you kind of navigate these waters and finding that right one and moving on, on toward marriage. Can we do that real quick today? Would you open with me over the book of Song of Solomon, Song of Solomon chapter 1. Song of Solomon, chapter 1. Before I jump into that scripture, let me give you what I think is probably one of the single most important um, principles when it comes to dating. What's the point of dating? So, I just met you. We're going to get married someday. I got to get to, I got to get to know you, right? I've got to discover whether or not you're the person that I'm going to marry. Okay, so... A very good thing to understand about dating is that you only do it when you're ready to get married. What movie was that from? Remember that? Marriage. Okay, anyway. Thank you. Oh, wow. Yeah. We're... Only do it when you're ready to get married. I, I cannot understand why people date when they have no intention of ever getting married, or they're in a season of their life where it's like, what? You're not even close to being married. What? You're 12 years old. You're 14. This is my girlfriend. This is my boy. What? What you're doing in that season of your life, listen, my friends, if you are not ready to get married, in other words, there's some momentum in your life, you got a job, right? And you're like, you're working, to, like you're grown up here. And if you're not in that season of your life, you have no business dating. You're setting yourself up for trouble is what you're doing, all right? My kids ask me all the time, mom, dad, when, when can we date? And I say, listen to me, when you've got some momentum in your life, like you are paying your own rent, you're paying your own, you know, gas for your car, you get, like you're, you're going to school, you've graduated, and so like there's momentum in your life, and you're going, hey, someday I might get married. Well, now you've got some momentum that somebody can get caught up in, and then we can start talking about dating. Are you with me? We need to guard our children, amen? And this whole world of I need to start dating, son, you're 12. No, you don't. No, you don't, buddy. You got to wait. Wait until there's that momentum in your life toward marriage. You only date when you're ready to look at getting married. Do you guys still love me? Are you with me? Some of you do. Okay. Hang with me. Here we go. Four questions. Song of Solomon, chapter one. We see this amazing couple. It's, it's Solomon and the Shulamite woman. We don't know her name, so we call her the Shulamite woman. She's got a bunch of buddies. We call them the doo-wop sisters every now and then. They jump in because you got to know men. Whenever you get into a relationship with a girl, she's going to have a whole lot of other friends that are going to be in that relationship with you. 
And she will go to them with everything and anything. And so you see these doo-wop sisters throughout the book, throughout the book of Song of Solomon. We're just going to look at a few verses in chapter 1, because what's happening here in chapter 1 is we see this couple meet for the very first time, fall in love, start dating as they move toward, toward marriage. And I'm going to give you principles on marriage as we move through it too. The book of Song of Solomon is actually this couple meeting, falling in love, dating, getting married. They go out on their honeymoon. They actually get in a fight just after their honeymoon. They work through their fight. It's, it's a beautiful book, and they end up having a love that lasts, a mature love that, that lasts. But what we see here in this very first part is them meeting for the very first time, and we run into our first principle, our first question, as we read through it. Song of Solomon, chapter 1, verse 1. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Let him, this is her speaking, the girl. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For your love is better than wine. Because of the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is ointment poured forth. Therefore, the virgins do love you. Draw me away. So much for a slow start. The Shulamite woman sees Solomon for the very first time. And the very first thing out of her mouth is, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Which brings up my very first point, which is, this attraction is a good question. Do I like what I see? How many of you heard it said before that looks don't matter? Raise up your hand. Looks don't. Come on, you heard that said looks don't matter. Can we just get real in here today? Listen, looks might not be everything, but they are definitely a thing. She sees this man walk into the room, and she says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his... That's the first thing she thinks. We got to know, like, Saul, she was attracted to the guy. Amen? Can I tell you when I met my wife, my, I had a friend drag me to youth group. I wasn't really a church kind of kid. And she, my friend drags me to youth group. I go to youth group, and I see this girl that I've seen at, like, different parties and stuff, not at church parties, but other parties that I shouldn't have gone to, but was. So I'm like super surprised that this girl's at church. I go, what are you doing here at church? She goes, that girl over there brought me. And she pointed at who is now my wife, Tatum. Here's what went through my mind when I looked over at Tatum. I bet she's got a good personality. <laughs> nope. You know what went through my mind? I looked over and I said, I am coming back to church. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I am walking with Jesus and saved today because there is a pretty girl in church, right? I looked over and I said, wow. Wow. I, what, I was physically attracted to that girl. Matter of fact, true story, that is why I came back to church. <laughs> Just getting real. All right. The Shulamite says, I'm intoxicated with this guy. She compares the effects that he's having on her to that of alcohol. She's just saying, like, like I, I'm intoxicated. I'm, like, weak in the knees. I, oh, she's like, I'm trying to catch my, catch my breath. This guy was so stunning in her eyes. And so guys listen to me. Guys and girls listen to me. We tell ourselves, look, don't matter. But, but you need to understand this. They might not be the most important thing, but they are definitely a thing. You definitely want to be attracted to the person that you're dating or that you're going to marry. You obviously want them attracted to you, amen? Like you don't want the biggest compliment they can give you to be, I really like your family, right? Or you've got a great personality. You know, all of that's important. But you want that guy, girls, you want that guy to look you in the eyes and say, girl, you're stunning. You're beautiful to me, right? You want, you want that person to be attracted to you. And there's nothing wrong with that. Matter of fact, I believe you absolutely need it. Do I like what I see? I want you to notice something about Solomon in regards to this whole thing. Solomon, it says that he walked in, and because, she says in verse 3, because of the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is ointment poured, poured forth. Solomon walked in, and what was he wearing? Cologna. Okay, he's wearing some cologne. The guy smelt good. What that tells me about Solomon is he understood the, the importance of looking good, of being attractive. The guy was single, and he didn't roll out of bed in the morning, you know, just kind of get out of bed and do my hair and 
show up and get myself a woman. That's not what, that's not what Solomon did. He got out of bed and took care of himself before he went out. Now, again, it's not the most important thing, but it is a thing. And we need to make sure that we are good stewards of the bodies God has given us. I know Pastor Sean talked with you guys a lot about this last week. No, we're not trying to look like the magazines. No, we're not going to bow to the world's system of telling us what's beautiful and what's not. But we are going to do the best we can with what God has given us to steward. Amen? And so, gentlemen, listen to me. When you get out of bed in the morning, you're a single man. You, you take a shower, <laughs> use water, use soap in that order, and then rinse it all back off, okay? You get out, you do your hair. You get dressed up nice. You, you go out. You, it's okay to pay attention to, to those details. Girls, it's okay to take care of yourself, you know, and, and, and be a, just do the best you can with the body God has given, given you and honor God in that way. I'm not talking about striving to be something that you're not. This isn't changing your body shapes or sizes or whatever. This is you just being a good steward and understanding that God has uniquely designed each and every one of us. And contrary to popular opinion and the belief that's pushed by our media, different people are attracted to different things. Amen? Not everyone likes the same thing. And God's made us different ways. And you just, you just, you just be okay with that. But do the best you can with what God's given you. Now, married, I'm going to tell you this as well. When you, get, when you get married, don't quit taking care of yourself. See this all the time. People use marriage as an excuse to kind of like, well, we got married and just kind of let myself go. Well, listen, girls, if your husband's into that, then cool, let yourself go. <laughs> like, you know, he's, he's, I'm really into the let, my, let yourself go look. Well, good, that's good. You just let yourself. But if he's not into that, it's okay to take care of yourself, right? To try. You guys with me today? You're laughing in the front row. It's okay to, it's okay to, it's okay to, to try and to continue to look nice. Uh, my wife, to this day, do you think I walk out of the house wearing anything that she doesn't like? No, no. She shows me, you will wear this and you will wear that. I used to have blonde tips in my hair. You know why? Not because I thought it was cool, because she thought it was cool. The cologne I wear, do you know why I wear it? Not because I like it, but she likes it, right? See, so you just keep, you keep on keeping on in this. It's it's attraction. God gives us that. It's a gift. Amen? It's a gift. And we need to make sure that we are moving forward in, in, in that way. Physical attraction is a good thing, but it can never be the core thing. More important than that, and the next thing is this, is character. Write that one down. So not just attraction, but character. And here's your question with character. Do I like who they are? More important than physical attraction is this question of character. She says, your name... It's like ointment poured out. And in that day, your name was more than just what you were called. Your name represented who you were. And she's saying your, your name is, is a beautiful thing. There's riches in his name. And we need to guard our character, amen? When you're single, the question isn't just looking for the right one. It's looking to be the right one, amen? Amen? Allowing God to make you who you are. Being honest with yourself about what God's doing in your heart and letting those things work themselves out as you're a single person. And as you go into uh, a dating relationship, you want to be growing in your character, growing in your love for Jesus, growing in your pursuit of God and all the things that he has for your life. My friend, riches can and will fail. Looks can and will fail. But character will never fail. Character is that foundation that you want to stand on. Boys, the amazing godly woman that you want to end up with someday is looking for an amazing godly young man, an amazing godly man to sweep her off her feet. So you've got to focus on your character. She does not care what level you're at on your Xbox game. Amen, girls? She doesn't care how long you sat around in your chonies playing Xbox all day. She wants to know, listen, that you've got some momentum in your life. And so here we go. You're going to love Jesus. Girls, aren't you? You want that, right? You want your, this guy to love Jesus. You want him to have a job. That's a good thing to have, right? 
momentum in their life, momentum in their life, that they're moving and that they're serving in the church, they're, they're honoring God with their life. Is there character there that you want to get behind? And young men or men in here today who are, who are single looking, looking to date, you got to make sure you're guarding that character. And girls, same for you. You just love Jesus with all your heart. You focus on, you focus on the Lord. You focus on being the one God has called you to be, and God will bring alongside you as you get caught up in that momentum, the one that he has for you. When you're dating, one of the main points of dating is to discover character. Character is the main thing that you're paying attention to. Is there love for Jesus evident in their life? There's some questions you need to ask. Is there love for Jesus evident in their life? If so, how? Not just yes it is, but how? How is it? Uh, do they reflect Christ's likeness? Are they selfless or selfish? Are they serving or expected to be served? Are they kind and gentle or are they harsh? How do they handle themselves under pressure? See, under pressure, these are all questions you need to be asking yourself when you're dating. You need to watch for character. And can I say this? When you're dating, you cannot possibly understand somebody's character if when you start dating, you guys pull yourselves away from society and become reclusive somewhere. You don't know somebody's character when you're off hiding away from the public. And I bring that up because I see this happen all the time. A, a couple will start dating, and then you're like, where did Bobby go? Like, I don't know. Him and Susie started dating. I haven't seen them since. Right? They're off doing their own thing. That's not healthy. You need to see that relationship, how the dynamics of that relationship work how, in the context of, of others, relationships. Uh, you want to be serving alongside them in church. You want to see them interacting with people. Bring them over to meet the family. You don't just disappear and fall off the face of of the map. You want to get to know that person in the context of other, other relationships. Tatum and I met, like I said, we met at 15, and we had all sorts of time to really get to know each other. And I am thankful to Jesus for that time that we got to go on mission trips together, see how, how we serve together, and all of that was taking place be, as we were dating and, and getting to know one another. But once you know, go, right? Once you know you're dating and you realize this is the one and you've spent the time getting to know one another, you know their character, you know that this is the one that God would have you to be married to, then go. I see so many times couples that they're, they're engaged. How long have you been engaged? Well, it's been like seven years. Seven years? Like, what are you waiting for, man? Well, you know, just the money and just the this and just the that. Listen to me, man. Just get married and God's going to take care of all that. Amen? Like, once you know, go. And... Um, don't be afraid of that once you, once you sense that in your heart. Here's a third question that you need to ask yourself. Security. Can I be who I am? I want you to see this in Song of Solomon. Let's pick it up where we left it off. She says, draw me away in verse 4. Now watch this. Draw me away. The doo sisters that I told you about, they yell out, we will run after you. This is the king has brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in you, the daughters of Jerusalem say. We will remember your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. This is her speaking. Now watch what she says. I am dark but lovely. O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon, do not look upon me because I am dark. Because the sun has tanned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. She's starting to get vulnerable with Solomon, letting him know some things that have happened in her, her life. She says, my mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyards I have not kept. Security. Can I be who I am? The Shulam I hear saying, Solomon, I need to let you know something. I, I have a past. My, my brothers used to make me work in the, in the vineyard, and, and my skin's been, been tanned from that, my, my family life was a little bit, bit, bit dysfunctional. And Solomon, are you going to accept me the way I am? Can I be who I am in this relationship? And this is one of my favorite points in this. When you're getting to know somebody, this is the big question that you need to ask. Not only is their character correct, do they love Jesus, are they pursuing the Lord, but, but can I bring myself into this relationship? Letting them see who I really am. 
Because how many of you know when you start dating somebody, you're getting around somebody, there's a temptation to put up a facade and begin to act like what you think they want you to be like. Did you follow that? And so I'm going to act like what I think you want me to be like, and I'm going to keep acting like what I think you want me to be like. And so we base the relationship on this acting like I think you want me to be like business, and so you got yourself a little dance going on. Here's my dance. This is my acting like I think you want me to be like dance, okay? It's a bad dance, but hang with me. Now, if I'm doing this all the time and we base our relationship on this, can I tell you something? This gets really tired, tiring really quick, right? It gets really tiring really quick. And, and if you are basing your relationship on that, you're in a dangerous place. What needs to happen is that you've got to learn to really have honest conversation with one another, get to know one another, find out is there security in this relationship? Can I be who I really am? You've, am. you've got to learn to get vulnerable and honest about well, first of all, your past. Like she does here. So let me tell you about my past. You've got to be able to talk about your successes. Talk about your failures. And true love's going to handle the truth. Amen? If that person is really right for you, they can handle the truth of who you really are, what you've really been through. You've got to get vulnerable and honest about not only your past, but your, your future, what your, your expectations are, your hopes, your dreams, the call of God upon your life. What you expect out of a relationship. Those are things you need to be able to start talking through. If you expect home-cooked meals and a well-kept house, guys, because that's what your mom did, well, you better have that conversation before you go to get married because she could be expecting not any of those things. <laughs> and you don't want to find out. You don't have to work through that lady. You work through it up front, together. I love you enough to work through this stuff. She may hate both of those well-kept houses and cooked meals. If you want kids, you got to talk through that up front. Can I be who I really am in this? Let me talk to you about what's going on in my heart. And that honesty, my friends, will bring you close. Being completely vulnerable with one another brings you close. And that takes time. Amen? You don't have these conversations on like, hi, we just met. How many kids do you want? Don't, that's, don't go there yet. Hi, we just met. Let me tell you everything from my past. But as you're spending time with one another, the question becomes, can I be who God's made me to be? Can I be who I really am in this relationship? And I want to say something to you too, Marys, before we move on to the last point. To you, Mary, it's on this, um, on this point. In your marriage, and I've seen this happen in marriages, where, where they get robbed of security, they're no longer able to be secure with one another. And what begins to happen is we hide behind facades. And so we, we shove down our true feelings and our true emotions and truly who we are in order to quote unquote keep the peace. Now I get that, but here's what you need to be cautious of. In a marriage, what God has designed marriage to do is to shape you with the spouse he's given you. And if the spouse he's given you is always hiding, well then the tool God has placed into that marriage is not being used in the way that God wants that tool to be used. Is any of this making sense? And so if you're in a marriage and you're, you're hiding for the sake of keeping peace, what you could be doing is in your hiding, you're robbing that relationship of what God intends for it to be. You need to learn to bring yourself into the marriage so that God can then shape the both of you within the marriage. You gotta learn to maybe fight well, to have hard conversations, to get counseling if you need to, to work through those things, but don't, don't hide those things, you understand? If there's things happening in here that you need to bear upon the relationship, bring them in. Because God could be using that to help shape that other person and you need to allow for that. Does that make sense? Are you with me today? And I see that in, in couples all the time. So what you have at home is you have, you have a, a political type of peace, but it's not true peace. Now, what you need in your marriage is true peace. And God can bring you that true peace. He can help you have a gospel-centered marriage where one repents and one forgives and you just move on together and you gotta, you gotta bring yourself into the marriage. Is there security? Can I be who I really am in this? And you need that within marriage. Let me give you the last one. She says in verse seven, tell me, oh, you whom I love, where are your feet and your flock? Where are you making it rest at noon? She says, Solomon, where are you going to be? 
I want to come spend some time with you today. I want to hang out with you today. And here's the last point. Last question. It's investment. Are they pursuing me? When you're in a dating relationship, and this is a big question, are they pursuing me? In a major way, a couple will pursue each other with their time. Solomon's busy, he's got a lot going on, and, and she wants to know, where are you gonna be around noon, man? I wanna, I wanna come spend some time with you, Solomon. I love being around you. That's the sign of a healthy relationship. I remember when Tatum and I were dating, we would invest in each other all the time. We'd be invest time in each other all the time. And so it scares me today when I hear people say, hey, I, I just need my space. Now hold on a second, because you're thinking, yourself, I just said that, whoops. It, it concerns me when you hear this, like, I just need my space, I just need my space. Can I just tell you, when, when I met my wife, and I fell in love with her and we started dating, I wanted to be around her all the time. I, I just loved being around her. It was like, I need my space. I love being around her. We did that whole cheesy thing where I'd, I'd call her, you know, we'd talk at 8 o'clock at night, 8 would turn to 10, 10 would turn to midnight, and you'd go, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, 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 you go first. And you just listen to each other breathe. <sighs> you still there? Super cheesy, but I wanted to be around her, pursuing, investing time. And so I totally get it, you know, guys, you, really, you need your guy time. Sure, go shoot your guns with the guys or whatever. Actually, I got corrected after first service. A girl comes up to me, she goes, well, my husband and I, we go out and we shoot stuff on our dates. I'm like, good. <laughs> I got family that, how many of you girls in here, you like to, you, you shoot some guns? Come on, yeah, love it. That's not a California thing, by the way, just so you know. You come teach our girls how to be real girls. All right. Now, so guys, you're like, I got to go shoot the guns with the guys. Sure, girls, you're going to go to the mall, the girl, whatever you're going to do, shoot your guns with the girls, whatever you're going to do. But here's the deal is why you're out doing that thing. Where's my heart? Where's my heart? My heart's, I miss, I miss, I miss her. I want to invest time with her. I'm so, I hang out with the guys, but I'm missing, missing my wife. You follow me? So it's okay to do those things, but where's the heart? If it's like pushing away all the time, that's a huge red flag. You need, you need to be in somebody that wants to be around you, wants to invest time with you, wants to just invest and pursue after you. You want to be around each other as much as possible. And you need to look for that when you're dating. Are they pursuing me? Marrieds, let me give you this. Listen to me. This is a... How many of you have kids in here? You're married and you have kids. Awesome. Listen, can I... Oh. You need to understand... What holds this whole thing together for you is that you choose, listen, to pursue each other. Are you pursuing each other? The kids are not the center of your marriage. Your marriage is the center of your marriage. And the most important thing you can give your kids is a healthy marriage. How do you give your kids a healthy marriage? You pursue each other. Take your girl out on a date. I don't leave my kids with babysitters. I don't ever go away from my kids. Listen to me. Make sure that your kids are not the center of your marriage. You'll end up ruining your kids. You put Jesus at the center and your spouse, you pour into each other. Give them a strong, healthy marriage, a strong, healthy mom and daddy that love each other. Because I see this happen all the time. Kids, the kids will move out and all of a sudden mom and dad are looking at each other like, who are you? Don't let that happen. You invest in each other. If you can't afford to go out, you do these things called serial dates. My wife and I do it all the time. We put the kids to bed. They're like, Daddy, it's only 7 o'clock. I'm like, I don't care. You're going to get your little rears to bed, shut the doors, because we're going to light some candles, and <laughs> you get to bed. We're going to have ourselves a serial date. And we go downstairs, we pour ourselves some Rice Krispies, and we have ourselves a date. We invest time in each other. We pursue each other. Listen to me. Last verse, Genesis. I use this all the time for... for Weddings. This is Genesis 2, 24. It says, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall, see this word here, cleave? Say it with me, cleave. Cleave to his wife and they shall be one flesh. That word cleave, here's what's going on. It's the word, Hebrew word, debak. It means to pursue it means to pursue. So, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall pursue his wife, and they shall be one 
one flesh. That word is actually used in other places in the Old Testament where one army is pursuing another army, you know, chasing them. It's a chase. So listen, that day that you're moving to from, from being a single to dating to that day where you are standing, saying your vows, that day, do you know what you were vowing to do? You're vowing not that we've been pursuing each other up to this point and now we're married. No, 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 no. You've been checking things out up to this point. And now you are committing your life to pursuing relentlessly that person that you're staring in the eyes that day. It's a commitment to pursuit, to pursue the one that God's given you for the rest of your life. And that's the secret to a healthy relationship. It's a secret to a healthy marriage is, listen, you wake up and go, am I pursuing the one God is? Am I chasing after the one that God has given me? Or am I just kind of like, yeah, I'm married now. No, 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 no. The adventure lies in, uh, lies in pursuing each other with your whole heart for the rest of your life. Now, I don't know where you're at today, but as we move toward response time, I want to ask that you would search your heart. If you're single in here today, God, have I surrendered my singleness to you? If you're married in here today, is this, God, am I honoring you in, in my marriage? Maybe the, the flames gone down in your passion and your pursuit for one another and God wants to rekindle that, he wants to reignite it. Whatever it is in your, your life today, you're dating, am I honoring God in my dating relationship? Are we asking the right questions about character? Are we asking the, the right questions over what God has for, are we being honest and, and developing an atmosphere of security within our dating relationship? Is that all those things that we have to wrestle with that you would really just genuinely search your heart today, knowing that none of our relationships will be healthy until this one with God is healthy. Amen. And so today, as we move to response, this, the, the candles on the, on the side, and maybe today lighting a candle for you is, is going to be a symbol of, of committing your, your singleness to Christ and allowing the Lord to use it in whatever way he would, he would desire. Maybe for those of you who are dating today, it's committing to Christ to burn pure in that relationship and to keep Jesus at the center, to keep pursuit of Christ at the center, developing your character and and the security God wants to bring into that thing. For you marrieds, maybe for you today, it's that question of, am I pursuing the one that God has given me? And the Lord needs to reignite that within your heart today. The cross is where we can go and ask the Lord to forgive us. I love that scripture says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and what? Cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God is more ready to forgive you than you are to say, I'm sorry sometimes. He's just waiting. So today, as we move into response, that we would surrender every aspect and every area of our life to Jesus Christ. If you wanna give today as you, we continue to worship, you do that as well. But church, let's stand to our feet as we sing out, as we pray, let's stand to our feet. God, we thank you, Jesus, for your love. We thank you, Jesus, for your pursuit of us. That, God, you never give up. You never give in. That, Lord, no matter where we are, what we've gone through in our life, what we've done, what we haven't done, there's an there's a unrelenting God in heaven in pursuit of us today. And Jesus, today, we want to examine our hearts before you. We want to respond to your word in a way, God, that would have, um, would change us and have impact on, on who we are. And so, God, we love you. We thank you for giving us relationships. We thank you for giving your, your word to help us guide us in those relationships. But God, we realize that the most important one is with you. And so, Father, as David prayed, search us, try us, know us, see if there's any wicked way in us, Lord. That we might be those who are standing pure before you today. Search our hearts, God. We love you and we worship you. In Jesus' name.
Let's worship together.